you missed me. It's time for some actual electrical content on designing and cutting your costs and that kind of thing. This video is for educational purposes only. Don't go copying this. It's not the full ins and outs of it. It's just an example on how with some savvy design, you can cut your costs on bigger things. I'll explain, don't worry, it'll all come together in the end, I'm sure. I'm stood between two big engines here, and in each one of these big engines is one of these. This is an alternator, this is what makes the go-go juice that supplies all your electricity and stuff. And on this side, there's 12 of these engines, and there's 12 of these alternators. These particular ones are LV. Let me show you where it goes after it leaves this alternator. After it leaves that alternator, it ends up here. This is the synchronization breaker. I'm not gonna go into this particularly because there's a whole video on my YouTube about synchronization breaks and what we're doing. But basically, when the alternator is good to feed energy onto the grid, this closes and makes the electricity that's being made in there go out to you and all your friends and your mum's dildo and stuff like that, yeah? That's what, that's the first line of protection that protects the alternator and acts as a switch to turn it onto the grid. Because it's coming out as LV, it then goes to this transformer. This transformer kicks it back up to, I think, 11,000 volts, but that's irrelevant. And then this 11,000 volt breaker goes to our HV substation and starts its journey back onto the grid. But what's weird is here, on this particular site, is there's 12 engines, but there's only six transformers. So, if there's six transformers here, there's 12 engines, but six transformers. So these are HV, so in the HV sub, there must be six switches, once for each transformer, yeah? Let's go and have a nose. So as you'd imagine, those six transformers come back in and they go to three switches. That's wrong, isn't it? That's wrong compared to what you know. Let's dial it back and work out, let's look at some Still a little bit more simple that people are a little bit more used to. Again, right, I'm dialing this back to make it understandable as a concept. I'm not explaining it fully. I'm just going to explain why that's like that. So don't take this as a design course. Don't start designing generator sites like this. This is an example of why something's done like that, which I'm going to come to at the conclusion. But let's dial it back. So yeah, if you know what you're doing, I know I'm skimming over a large amount of technical detail here to get this message across, but it's not aimed at you, Billy Big Balls. This is aimed, aimed at people trying to learn new things. So fuck off. Let's go all domestic on it, yeah? Let's imagine you've got a house, and on the heating system, you've got a heat manifold that needs power that controls, say, the underfloor heating, and you need a spur for the boiler, yeah? Now, traditionally, when you design a circuit, you'd have a protected device, which I've shown here, and then you'd run a cable out to the spur, which would act as a local isolation and fuse for the heat manifold and the boiler. And in the way I've drawn it here, I've got two spurs, two bits of cable and two fuses. Now, is that necessarily a good way of doing it? Because it works, it's fine, but I've used a lot of cable and I've used two fuses in my board and that might limit me on space and things like that. So the other option is I could use the boiler manifold spur and the heater manifold spur. They're both heating and I could connect it to one protect device called heating things. And that is providing power to both those circuits, yeah? Through a little bit of a weird design because I've used two cables, but is that compliant? Now what I've done is I've offered another solution. So these two spurs that I need, I've got rid of this cable and I've made a little radio with two spurs on. That goes back to a fuse and it says heating. Yeah, that's traditionally more like what you'd do. But what if one of these was in such a direction that it was more economical to run the two separate cables? Is that original circuit I've drawn viable? So can you have two cables coming out of one breaker feeding two spurs? Now, my thought, I'm not doing my design on this yet, and I know it's a bit of an orthodox method, but what I'm saying is, is although you've got two cables in a breaker, yeah, and that is inefficient for maintenance, if it was lights, you wouldn't do that on lights because you'd flick off one brake and take out loads of lights. You wouldn't do that on sockets because you'd flick off one brake and take out loads of sockets. But if they're both related to the same thing, i.e. the heating, one will not work without the other, is there anything wrong with taking those two cables out of that breaker to two three-amp spurs to control the heating? I would say not. It's not what you'd normally do in a house. You'd throw a few sparks if they found something like that. But if it was, say, a 10-amp breaker feeding two 3-amp spurs, I don't think there's a problem with it. And what it does is it's reduced the amount of breakers you need by one, which is useful. If you're doing 300 houses, you're going to save 300 breakers, which starts to add up to a considerable amount of money. Then, if we look at 
these 300 hours you're going to test them for the next five years, when you go to these jobs, you're only going to have to write the heating breaker on the schedule of test inspections once. You're going to test the two cables at the board and go and get your readings off the fuses. So you're effectively going to save the man hours of testing two separate circuits and certifying two separate circuits when you can use one in an albeit not normal arrangement. And that's what we're getting at is what design changes and things can we make that reduce the running costs, the maintenance costs and the installation costs that may then affect isolations and the amount of downtime you have and all that. So let me go back to where it was now and explain the situation out here. Well, I'll do a little bit more here first. One second. If we go back to this house example, generally, in the grand scheme of things, yeah, these fuses are cheap, this cable is cheap, and these breakers are cheap. So doing this, although it can save time and money on the job as it currently is, and in the long run on the maintenance, yeah, you might just throw it in like this because these breakers are, what, six quid a pop? And in a domestic situation, it's not going to make a massive amount of difference. Also, in a domestic situation, this is traditionally how it's done, and you are used to having protection for a cable to a device. But that is all happening here on the breaker. Whereas with the bigger things, we have more protection options going off. So with what I've just shown you, the 12 engines, they're not just engines and alternators and that, that sink breaker I showed you. There's loads more protection going off. Electronic protection, electronics and programming, clever stuff, yeah. That engine has got sensors and CTs and displays and dials and bobbins all over it, yeah? That all their job is, is to maintain the, and protect that engine. The engine effectively spins around through burning fuel, spins the alternator, which produces electricity. To be fair, we could omit all the protection, everything, and it would still run. It's just that when it went wrong, it would destroy itself as a very, very expensive asset. So rather than just relying on fuses and breakers and what you would see as traditional um, overload protection and fault protection, we have all sorts of crazy fucking electronics, computers, looking at that all day long to maintain level protection, which is far in excess of a breaker or an MCB. It's the same with the transformer. The transformer is not just a simple case of cables going in, cables coming out. It has other protection methods on it that are electronic. It has like temperature sensors in it, oil pressure sensors, oil level sensors, book holes for all you cool kids out there know what that is. And that also has a large amount of protection that's in there that's not just a simple MCB, it's all electronics and gubbins and failsafe stuff like that. And then it's the same in here. This is a breaker, effectively, but it's got this, a CPAM relay, H3 tripping relay, does all sorts of crazy stuff, looks at all sorts of crazy things and makes decisions based on what it sees. Not just a breaker, it can look at all the gubbins to relate to the HV stuff. And because we've got all this electronic protection, we can wire things in a bit of a different way. So the general layout for anyone that's not worked it out yet is, we have one HV breaker that feeds two HV transformers, and each one of those transformers goes to two engines through two separate sink breakers into separate alternators. So that one HV switch goes to two transformers, goes to four engines. So instead of having four transformers and four HV switches, we only have two, thus reducing the cost by half. And because we only have one HV breaker on them, we reduce the cost by half. Like that. So this isn't just being cheap although it does cause some problems. So at the moment, for example, we're doing some work on one engine, but because we're like required a HV isolation to do it, we've got four engines off. If you'd wired them all, one breaker, one transformer, one engine, we'd only have one engine off. But because we want to work on one at the minute, we've got four off. So it's cost us more money to have four off. However, the upside is this. HV equipment, when it goes, it fucking goes. And there's all sorts of protections to stop it going. And by go, I mean explode. So, on this site now, although we're paying the price of having reduced amounts of equipment, because we've got four off instead of one, every year, when the HV breakers need to be inspected, on this particular site, instead of inspecting 12 of them, we're only inspecting four of them, the incomer and three outgoers. 
When the transformers require inspection and testing, certification and checking, we're checking six of them instead of 12 of them. And then on the engines, obviously, they are what they are. We have as many engines as we have. So the clever design reduces the amount of original infrastructure that needs to be purchased and it massively reduced the running costs over the lifetime of the installation. But because you have technically got two transformers on one breaker, that's not going to really work for overcome protection traditionally. So yeah, because we've got one breaker effectively feeding two transformers, which you wouldn't do in a house, would you? You wouldn't do that anywhere else. It's a bit, it's a bit out there. One breaker feeding two transformers, but both of them can trip it when they get faults. And the engines can also trip it when they get faults. We have this cascading effect of electronic and clever protection that massively reduces the inspection cost of the HV. And if you think about your house as well, from the substation near your house, there'll be a cable that runs underground that all the houses are teed off. And then each house has its own fuse. If every single house was wired from the HV substation to each individual house, it would cost an absolute fortune in cabling. You've probably got a cable that runs up your street that feeds, say, I don't know, 20 houses. The downside to this is if that cable breaks, you lose 20 houses. But the upside of that is that's not a very common occurrence. So the point is, after your LV distribution in the building or property you're working, yeah, you traditionally have a breaker, protective device, feeding a circuit. It doesn't work like that out in the bigger world because the costs would be excessive. And the way up between the excessive costs... And that if something goes wrong, the fact that you lose more assets is one that has to be counteracted. Savvy, <laughs> savvy design, <laughs> savvy design decisions <laughs> by making savvy design decisions. And that's what's happening here. So yeah, at the moment, we've got four off. We've probably saved we're losing a thousand pound because we've got four off. We've probably saved that in maintenance costs of not having to maintain double of everything for the period of time. That's the principle of it. Like I say, don't go just winding things up, doubling them up to save money. Don't work like that. Behind this design will be a load of clever maths that I don't prescribe to be a, a massive fan of or know what I'm doing. But that's how, on huge infrastructure, you keep your cost down. And now you know that, look outside your house. You'll find somewhere around your house there's a grey box or, or a fenced off thing with one of those transformers in. There'll be a little grey panel next to it, tend to be called Lucy panels or safe panels, yeah? And that'll feed the asses. And there's probably one cable up one side of the street, one cable up the other side of the street, or on a new building estate, there's probably one cable goes around the old fucking lot. Because what they're saying is, transformers don't fail very often. And if it does, the estate goes off. But then they'll chuck a generator in to feed it, or if there's a cable fault, they'll just find it. It doesn't happen very often, so the risk outweighs the cost, or the cost outweighs the risk, I don't fucking know. I'm not a fucking bean counter. So that's what happens. But look around you. You start seeing, go, well, there's only one transformer there. There's only one transformer at the road. And there's all these houses. There is not a single cable underground to each house. Otherwise, the pavements would be fucking 18 foot deep with cables, wouldn't there? Same with gas. One pipe, tees off. There you go. That's today's actual electrical content. Any questions? Good. What I will do is I'll actually take any questions on this because I'm going to be sat here for about two hours while I do this work so that I can replace something so the HV guy could turn the HV back on. So I could be sat in this van, which I've already cleaned, in the back uh, for an hour. So yeah, if anyone's got any questions, not like why have draft got long necks, I'll take them. One last thing as well is, yeah, I don't need to know the fucking science bit. I don't need to know the mass bit. I don't need to know the ins and outs. What's important that I know on a, a site like this or any site like this is that in the substation there'll be a single line drawing that shows you how all this is wide in this weird way. And all I need to do is, when I get to the site, is look at that drawing, look at what's on the site, and work out what goes where. So if I want to isolate a certain engine or a certain bit of equipment, I know that I'm going to take off four pieces of equipment and which ones those will be, and I can relay that.